welcome to worship for this week. Uh, before I get started with the service, just a couple of announcements. First of all, I should probably explain the hat. Um, as you all remember, no, today is the 29th. This was going to be the weekend when baseball season opened, which meant it was also going to be the weekend when we had our first Sunday of baseball season service. Unfortunately, of course, both of those things are postponed. We do not know when either one of them will take place, but since today is the 29th, I am proudly wearing my New York Mets cap. Um, the other thing, another thing I'd like to do is I would like to thank the folks who are making this service possible. Um, last week, we, we had uh, the, the volunteer help from John Paul and Vera Lynn, who you could see, and we also had help from Bethany and Bethany's friend Jen, who you could not see because they have become our crack video team. Um, John Paul, Bethany, and Jen are back again this week. This week, we are joined by David Finley, who will be our guest soloist today, and we are delighted to have him with us. Um, one last thing before we get started. I want to thank everybody for the reaction that, that we've gotten to some of the changes we've made this week. Uh, I heard a lot of good things from people about the first of our video services. I also heard a good reaction from people about the new online uh, eSpire that we sent out uh, during the week. And by all means, if, if you have comments or suggestions or ideas, uh, we definitely want you to share them. I definitely want to hear about them. If you would like to respond to anything that I send out in an email or, or in the eSpire, that is terrific. I'm just going to ask you to do one thing. I suppose that's two things. One thing. What I'm going to ask you to do is if I send out some communication to the entire church, if it's an all-church email or if it's the eSpire, and you want to respond to that, please do it in a separate email. Don't just hit reply. Because what happens is 17 people will hit reply, and so I end up with a really long chain of email messages. And since I want to respond to everybody, I'm afraid that I'll miss somebody if the list gets too long. So just to make sure that I read your message and I get a chance to respond, if you could please reply in a separate message, that would be terrific. Another thing that's related to that a little bit is some of you have my cell phone number and you've been texting me, which is fine. That's absolutely fine. But if you do text me, could you do me a favor and identify who you are? Because when you text me, all I get is a cell phone number and our directory doesn't have cell phone numbers in it. So if you don't tell me who you are, I don't know. So if you could do that, if you text me, if you could just start by letting me know who you are, that would be terrific because then I know who I'm talking with. Um, and I think those are the announcements for this week. So our worship service will begin with our first hymn, which is number 311, Now the Green Blade Rises. Oh, and look for the words on the screen this week. <laughs> Sundays in Lent, we are called to a discipline of, of self-examination. 
And as part of that process of self-examination, let us take time now in this service to both together and then silently make our confession before God. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living, lasting God, you hate nothing you have made, and forgive all who are penitent. Create in us new and contrite hearts, so that we, lamenting our sins and acknowledging our weakness, may obtain of you, the God of all mercy, perfect forgiveness, through Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, those whom the sun sets free are free indeed. Therefore, I declare to all of us the complete forgiveness of all our sins through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, the one whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after that, he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews are just now trying to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of the world, this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, My brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary. 
and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. And so the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead, the dead man, said to him, Lord, there already is a stench, because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you will always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Here ends the reading. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts prove acceptable in your sight. For you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. There have been, by my count, 13 Star Trek movies, and I have seen them all. And of all 13, my favorite is the second one, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. <coughs> now, for those of you who are not familiar with that particular cinematic treasure, it starts with the USS Enterprise on a routine training mission. Its crew is composed almost entirely of Starfleet Academy cadets. For many of them, this will be their first trip into deep space. The Enterprise is not under the command of James T. Kirk, rather it's being commanded by Captain Spock. Kirk is on board, but since he's been kicked upstairs to Admiral, he's only here as an observer. Or at least he's only supposed to be there as an observer. But of course, this being Star Trek, complications almost immediately ensue. The Enterprise is pressed back into active duty, and since he's the senior officer on board, Kirk prepares to take command. <coughs> but before he does that, he's got a question for Captain Spock. He asks Spock how he thinks this group of cadets will react to this new and unexpected and potentially extremely dangerous situation. And Spock, in that wonderfully Vulcan way of his, says, as with all living things, each according to his gifts. I have always thought that Spock was trying to tell Kirk two things with that statement. <coughs> I think the first thing he was trying to tell Kirk was that he had absolutely no idea how these cadets were going to react, and so he wasn't even going to try to predict. But I think the second thing that Spock was trying to tell Kirk was that however the cadets reacted, those reactions would be rooted in who they were. And that since they were all different people, the cadets on board were probably all going to react a little bit differently. Some would rise to the occasion, some would exceed the occasion. But there would be others who weren't, or who didn't. And that, of course, isn't just true on Star Trek movies. 
you've probably noticed more than once over the years that there are times where different people will face the same situation and react in completely different ways. Some people, like I said, will rise to the situation, but other people won't. Some people react with fear. Some people react with anger. Some people react by trying to blame someone else for their problems, and other people just want to give up. But then there are other people who make a plan. There are other people who go to work. There are other people who do whatever they can to muddle through and to try to pull something good out of a bad situation. I was thinking about that, the way people react to unexpected situations. I was getting ready to talk to you about our scripture reading for this week because one of the ways you can talk about this marathon reading from John's gospel is precisely as a story about how different people react to the same thing in different ways. Now, the story doesn't begin with Jesus. It begins with three people named Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They are, of course, brother and sisters. They all live together in a town called Bethany, Bethany in Jesus' day is just a couple of miles north of Jerusalem proper. And apparently, whenever Jesus and his disciples visited Jerusalem, it was their custom to stay with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. <coughs> we know from John's Gospel that there are other times where they did that. And so as a result of that, Jesus, Mary, and Martha have spent a lot of time together. And they've apparently developed a very close relationship. At least that's what the story tells us. But as the story begins, Lazarus has fallen ill. In fact, he's so sick, the people are beginning to wonder if he is going to survive. Now, we don't know exactly what disease Lazarus was suffering from. And quite frankly, it doesn't matter, because in Jesus' day, almost any disease could kill you. Yeah, this is something that many of us are dealing with for the first time in our lives, a, a disease for which there is no vaccine, a disease with, with it, with which, for which there is no cure, or for which there really isn't even any treatment. For many of us living through this COVID-19 pandemic, this is the first time in our lives where we faced a disease like this. But back in Jesus' day, there was an almost limitless way to die from getting sick. And Lazarus apparently has fallen under one of those ways. And so Mary and Martha <coughs> send a message to Jesus. And they tell him, the one you love is ill. And when Jesus receives the message, he does absolutely nothing. Except to tell his disciples that Lazarus is not going to be sick unto death. We're told that Jesus and his disciples stay wherever it is they are for an additional two days. And, and at some point during those two days, Lazarus dies. And it's only after Jesus knows that Lazarus is dead that he decides to return to Judea and to Bethany. And so Jesus and his disciples make their way to Bethany. And when they get to the outskirts of the town, they are greeted by Lazarus' sister, Martha. And Martha, when she sees Jesus, says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. At least, that's what Mary says. But if I were a betting man, I would bet that while that's what she says, it's probably not the way she says it. Because you see, we know a little bit about Martha's personality from another story in which Martha appears as a central character. And this is another story that takes place when Jesus is staying with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. In this particular story, Jesus is teaching in the living room, and Mar Martha's sister Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet listening to what Jesus has to say. Martha, for her part, is in the kitchen. She's busy making sure the evening goes the way that it's supposed to go. She's busy making sure the servants do what they're supposed to do. She's busy making sure the meal is prepared properly. She's busy making sure that the dining room is prepared for the meal that's about to take place. She's dedicating her entire evening, all her efforts, to making sure the evening goes the way it's supposed to go. And finally, Martha has what I like to think of as her Popeye moment. Her moment when she has had all she can stands and she can't stands no more. And so she goes storming into the living room and she says, Jesus, tell my lazy sister to get off her butt and to give me some help. 
And of course, those aren't exactly the words that Martha uses. But you get the point. I think from that little exchange, there are four things we learn about Martha. One, we learn that Martha is the sort of person who can get things done. Second, we learn that Martha is the sort of person who is not afraid to be in charge. Third, we learn that Martha is not afraid to tell people what to do, even if that person is Jesus. And fourth, we learn that Martha is the sort of person who is not afraid to speak her mind. And so now, today, when Jesus finally makes it back to Bethany, Martha says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And what's more, it's all your fault that he did where were you when we needed your help? Where were you when we asked you to do something for us? Because it's not like we haven't done plenty for you. Because every time you and your disciples come to Jerusalem, you stay here, and we put a roof over your head, and we make sure you've got something to eat. We have always taken care of you. But the one time we needed you to take care of us, where were you? So yes, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And it's all your fault that he did. And then Martha adds, I suppose, half hopefully and half sarcastically, but even now, I believe that God will do whatever you ask him to do if you're going to ask him to do anything. Jesus responds to what Martha says with some of the most famous words in Scripture. They're words that are so powerful that they've been a part of Christian funerals and Christian memorial services ever since. Jesus responds by saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she says to him, Yes, Lord, I believe. And if I could stop here for a second, I think that tells us something about the nature of faith. I think it tells us that, that some kinds of faith, at least, are not based so much on a feeling as they're based on a commitment. And as you might imagine, given my job, a lot of people have talked to me about faith over the years. And a lot of those people, when they talk to me about faith, they talk to me about something, you know, they talk to me about something that they feel inside. It's a feeling of affection, a feeling of love, a feeling of benevolence, a feeling of, of, of caring about other people, a feeling about love for God, a feeling about love for other people. When a lot of people talk to me about faith, that's what they talk about. They talk about something they feel. And I suppose it's okay to think about faith as something you feel, as long as you feel it. But the problem with feelings is that they're not always there. Sometimes we feel things, and sometimes we don't. And I think for a lot of people, when they walk away from church, when they walk away from God, when they walk away from faith, I think the reason they do it is because they no longer feel the way they used to feel. Maybe something's happened. Maybe they faced a difficulty or they faced a tragedy. Someone's gotten sick. They've lost a job, whatever it is. And as a result of that situation, their feelings have changed. And so they no longer feel the way they used to feel. They walk away from what they used to do. They can walk away from God or church or faith. But I think it's clear from this story that, that Martha's faith isn't based on what she feels, because right now she has no reason to feel kindly about Jesus. After all, Jesus is the person who did not respond to her in her hour of need. Jesus, the way she looks at it, is the guy who let her brother die. She has every reason to be disappointed. She has every reason to feel betrayed. She has every reason to be absolutely furious with Jesus. And yet she still says that she believes. And I think Mary still believes because her faith isn't founded on what she feels. Her faith is based on a commitment that she has made. 
She has come to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he's the Messiah. That she is the one, that he is the one God has sent into the world to redeem the world. And believing that, she has committed herself to following him and serving him, even when she doesn't quite feel like it. Because her faith isn't based on what she feels. It's based on a commitment that she's made. And after she talks with Jesus, Martha leaves to go get her sister Mary. Mary comes out, and we're told that Mary falls at Jesus' feet, weeping, and once again says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when we see how Mary says those words, we can see that Mary is a very different person from her sister Martha. Because when Martha went out to see Jesus, she did not fall at his knees, and she was not crying. Mary and Martha are very different people. And so they react to their brother's death and to Jesus' late return in very different ways. And once again, if I can stop for a second. I think that's another point that we might want to keep in mind over the days or the weeks or who knows, the months to come. Because for a long time, we're going to spend a lot of time cooped up with a lot of people who do not react to things the same way we do. We're going to be spending a lot of time with people who get upset about things we don't get upset about and with people who don't get upset about the things that we do get upset about. We're going to spend a lot of time with people who are different from us and who react to the same thing in different ways, which is going to give us all an opportunity to practice two of the most important and yet least popular of all the Christian virtues, patience and grace. We're going to need to practice patience with people we are cooped up with who simply refuse to behave the way we think they should behave. We're going to have to be patient with people who do not get upset when we do. We're going to have to be patient with people who do get upset when we don't. We're going to have to practice patience with people who just won't behave the way they should. And that means we're also going to get the chance to practice grace. We're going to get the chance to practice grace with people who behave differently not because they are dumb or because they are bad people or because they are ill-informed or because they're not smart or because of anything like that. We're going to have to be gracious with people who don't behave the way we want them to simply because they're different. Simply because they are not us. And since they are not us, they are not going to react to things the same way we will. And so, like it or not, we're all going to get the chance to practice patience and to practice grace and to ask God for the help that we need to do both. Because I can tell you right now, you're not going to be able to do them on your own. So after Jesus has his conversation with Mary, he says, where's the tomb? And so Mary takes Jesus to the tomb. And we're told in the story that Jesus gets to the tomb four days after Lazarus died, which is a significant detail. Because in the Jewish tradition of Jesus' day, the idea was that the body and the soul stayed together for three days after death. So that at any point during those three days, there was the opportunity, or at least the possibility, for resuscitation, or maybe even for resurrection. But that after those three days, the body and the soul went their separate ways, and death was final. <clears throat> and so John wants us all to understand that when Jesus gets to the tomb, he is already too late. It is already too late for Jesus to do any good. It is already too late for Jesus to bring some sort of joy out of sadness. It's already too late for Jesus to bring life out of death because Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. Nevertheless, Jesus tells the people there to roll the stone away from the tomb. And at some point, Martha came back to the crowd because when Jesus gives the order to move the stone away from the tomb, Martha, always the practically minded one, leans over to Jesus and says, Jesus, he's been
been dead for four days. He's gonna stink. Nevertheless, Jesus tells the folks to roll the stone away from the tomb. Even though it's impossible for Jesus to do any good, even though it's impossible for Jesus to make any difference at all, even though it's impossible for Jesus to bring life out of death. But of course, that's exactly what Jesus does. Jesus prays to God and then he calls out, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus does. There's no stink. There's no rot. There's no putrefaction. There's nothing that the people expected when they opened the tomb. The only thing that comes out of the tomb is Lazarus. And Lazarus comes out just as good as new. And once again, if I can stop for a second, I think there's one final point that we can take from this story. And that is the idea that no matter how bad things can get, God can always find a way to bring something good out of something that's bad. God can always find a way to bring hope out of something that seems to be hopeless. God can always find a way to bring life out of death. That's when God, that's what God has been doing in Christianity for 2,000 years now. And that's what God can, is still capable of doing today. So you might want to keep that in mind when things seem to be as bad as they can possibly be. You might want to keep that in mind when things seem hopeless, when things seem like they can't possibly get any worse, when it seems like there is nothing that anybody can do. Because no matter how bad things get, there's always something that God can do. Even when you're locked up at home in the midst of a COVID-19 epidemic. Amen. And our next hymn will be number 242, Lord, who throughout these 40 days. in his name. Guide us by your Holy Spirit, that our prayers may reflect your will and show your steadfast love through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Gracious God, you have called us to be the Church of Christ. Keep us one in faith and service, breaking bread together and proclaiming the good news to all so that all may believe you are love, turn to your ways, and walk in the light of your truth. God, our Creator, you made all things in your wisdom, and in your love you save us. We pray for the whole creation. Overthrow evil, right what is wrong, so that all your children may enjoy the earth you have made, and joyfully sing your praises. Eternal God, you sent your Son Jesus to break down the walls that divide us, establish peace on earth, and pull down pride, anger, and hatred, which divide person against person and nation against nation. 
Speed the day when all war shall end, and the whole world shall accept your rule. God of compassion, bless us and those we love, our friends and our families, so that drawing closer to you, we may be drawn closer to each other. At this time, Lord, we commend to your care all of the names and all of the situations mentioned on our parish prayer list. We also commend to your care the prayer request on each and every heart this morning. And Lord, we are bold at this time to give you thanks, to give you thanks that you will hear our prayers and that having heard them, you will answer them as is best for us, according to your wisdom and your mercy. And finally, mighty God, whose word we trust and whose spirit enables us to pray, we thank you that you have heard our prayers and that you will answer them according to your will. For we pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever, and who taught us to pray together, saying, Just a closer walk with me.
Elvis Presley's version of that song, find it somewhere. It is the most Elvis hymn ever. And on that note, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. And may the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you, now and always.